Well, if you're okay with it, I mean, we'll have a small crew. We'll jump in, um, talk about the research. I'm so grateful for your time and your commitment and joining this this research endeavor of mine uh, on ranked choice voting and the title that we came up with being uh, a promising but imperfect cure for America's terminal political state, uh, recognizing that there's there's changes that need to be made to it to to make it as effective as it could be, uh, but that at large it, it's it moves us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. When I thought about how to communicate the importance, make sure this is working. Let's see, I think we're frozen. Uh oh, it's always something, man. <laughs> Let's try. You can always count on technology. Right. How about that? Let's try that. There you right. go. There we go. So when I've been asked to communicate the state of our politics and various papers, research papers, essays. I've often come back to this analogy of the river, of the raging river. And depending on your viewpoint, you could be an elected official, you could be a constituent, but you're standing on one side and either power or constituency stands on the other. Mm -hmm. And as the corrupting influences of politics, as the moneyed interests continue to increase in prevalence in our politics, continuing to create distance between the elected officials and the constituents for whom they serve. It becomes more difficult to comprehend what it is the constituents want to see, and it becomes more daunting for those who choose to cross it. The proverbial Delaware River, if you will, the, the very few who choose to cross it have ample resources, they have a vessel, they have a team, they have the, the financial means to do so. Uh, and for those that, that do not, uh, they don't have the opportunity to, to envision and enact their, their desire, their goal, their vision for elected office. On the constituent side, that being that they they feel it's impossible to cross and, and for the elected official that they can't hear um, the interests of their constituents because of these, these factors. My essential thesis is that ranked choice voting, if implemented correctly and adapted to meet the rising challenges that I highlight, will attract emerging talent to elected office, will moderate the intensity of political division, and will give a voice to a disheartened electorate. 72% of Americans are unsatisfied with the way our nation is being governed. 19% do not trust or do trust uh, in government to do what is right, only 19%. And 55% of Americans believe the US will cease to be a democracy one day. In 2020, the Center for Systemic Peace downgraded the United States from a democracy to an anocracy, also known as a partial democracy. The proverbial lesser of two evils is something that voters are well aware of and, and acquainted with, this concept that you are choosing between two of the worst options uh, given to you by the parties, given to you by the, the primary process, and the fear that by voting a different route, you're throwing away your vote. Uh, that it counts for nothing, that uh, the third party candidate would never win all of these these claims that we've heard before that have impacted uh, the efficacy and viability of a third party run. I think about the party queue, right? This concept that there are many in front of you, many in front of those third party officials, many in front of those who, who have bold ideas that are challenging the establishment, uh, but that don't have the means to to cut to the front of the line or or they don't see a feasible route to, to reaching power, or they face this inevitable challenge that every independent does at, at some point in their political career is when do I affiliate? When do I take one path or the other? Uh, when do I choose uh, the compromises, the concessions, um, the specific agenda that comes with that pathway? Uh, or do I choose to not take one at all? Do I forfeit my, my visions, my dreams for the future uh, of serving a nation uh, that so desperately needs it in a disheartened electorate? As you all know, this is a common outcome of a familiar story, right? That 60% of the electorate votes for the other candidate, for the other candidates, that 60% is against the candidate who wins. In the plurality election system, uh, the, the most votes wins, of course, as you all know. The example of the ranked choice ballot being you select your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, uh, and that you have the opportunity to enact your, your heart vote, or as the scholarship says, your your preferential vote rather than your strategic vote. Uh, to be able to do both simultaneously in a ballot is the essence of ranked choice voting, that you shouldn't have to sacrifice one for the other. 
Now, this is the example we start with candidate one, 40 percent, candidate two, 35 percent, candidate three, 25 percent. Neither candidate, none of the candidates, of course, have crossed the majority threshold, the, the concept of legitimacy in our system, the majoritarian democracy. Uh, so none of them win uh, under a ranked choice voting election. At, what, at, which, at which point candidate three is dropped from the race. Candidate three is 20 percent of their voters move over to candidate two and 5 percent moves over to candidate one. Um, thus pushing candidate two across the threshold and, and claiming victory. Ranked choice voting is currently used as I highlight in my uh, in my thesis, and, and I do need to update um, to reflect the data, but 20 plus US states that use ranked choice voting in some form, uh, 52 municipalities across the United States, a number of countries, uh, right, that I mentioned, Ireland, Australia, uh, Israel, uh, Malta, Fiji, uh, there are a number that have been using it for many years, right? And they use the single transferable vote, which is for multi-member districts, uh, where you take the surplus off of the top. You have a designated threshold, and uh, and anyone who meets that threshold, any votes that they surpass that, uh, would then be reallocated to the other candidates in the race until you have your designated slate of candidates uh, that are elected. That is not what I'll be focusing on today. Primarily, the the alternative vote, uh, the instant runoff voting, IRB AT. These are the questions that I used as I was researching. Does ranked choice voting alleviate or exacerbate partisan divisions uh, in hostile political culture? How does RCV influence two-party system and political establishment? And will ranked choice voting influence the health and future of American democracy? When we consider the voter turnout implications of ranked choice voting, the scholarship did not have a consensus on this, is one thing I'll note. 96 non-presidential elections, according to Kimball and Anthony, uh, highlighted that there was a, a slight decrease in the cities immediately following implementation of ranked choice voting. Uh, but there was also a decrease in, in the other plurality cities of that same study. Um, what the data doesn't show immediately is that there was an increase of about 9% uh, in total primary and runoff election uh, voter turnout, which is what ranked choice voting is designed to do. I, I would suspect that is related to the increased number of candidates that are in the race, the increased enthusiasm um, in the race, and of course, the, the ease with which candidates can vote, uh, not having to come out for a runoff election, and the challenges that that brings in, in voter drop off between the general election or between the primary general and then the runoff election if it's necessary. And then on the right, we highlight the, uh, the voter turnout of Minneapolis. This is an example, a case study that many of the RCV proponents use and reference. Uh, is the increase in each of the, the socioeconomic wards in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, the most prominent being in the low income wards in Minneapolis. Uh, and, a, and a fascinating example of that, 2005 being the pre-RCV uh, time period and then 2013 uh, being after. When we look back to 1860, the Republican National Convention, the selection uh, of the presidential candidate uh, for the Republican Party in 1860, um, you all probably know as scholars, but uh, President Lincoln was received about 20 percent of the support uh, of the, the convention out of the gates. And over time, over a series of tabulations uh, and days of caucusing, ultimately reached 75 percent support from from his caucus, but began at 20 percent. And I have to wonder if he had not had in that moment the political ingenuity, the skill, the ability to articulate his vision in the way that he did going against William H. Seward, who was the governor of New York at the time, uh, and, and touted as the, the next nominee of the GOP in 1860. That's important to ask if, if he hadn't been elected. He wasn't the best candidate, but he was the right president. If he hadn't been elected, we wonder what the future of our country may have held um, and where we would be today if it weren't for that decisive moment in American history. Uh, and it started with a candidate who came from behind. And the scholarship suggests that about 57% of the time that happens in, in national conventions. Uh, nonetheless, how can we continue to design systems, processes, procedures that find the Lincolns of our, uh, of our candidate pool and ensure that they can succeed? As Richie et al. highlights, uh, one of the challenges or and benefits of ranked choice voting, one of the benefits being the rescued votes. Uh, for those candidates, those uh, voters in the electorate who vote for a candidate that drops out before election day. Uh, so between the, or, or apologies, between the, um, who cast their ballot, mail-in ballot, early voting, other things like that, uh, that vote before the primary election day. Um, Four million votes from the Democratic side uh, were not counted in the 2020 Democratic uh, primary as a result of voting for candidates that either dropped out before primary election day uh, were subjected to the political forces that convinced them to step away 
uh, from the race, uh, or of course the possibility that they uh, that the, the candidate didn't reach the 15% threshold in the respective states that they were running in. And then also on the Republican side, 600,000 votes that weren't counted, that weren't considered. And the question I often wonder with, with this, those proactive voters who voted by mail, who voted early, many of whom voted for candidates that had great potential and great ideas, but didn't have the political force to reach the nomination. Um, I think the question has to be asked if those votes were counted, uh, if those votes were counted in an instant runoff voting context, uh, the political will would have have shifted the results. I, I firmly believe that, and and that that's what we have to explore in the data. When we look back to President Lincoln, 1843, he wrote a letter to Martin Morris. It would be proper for your meeting, referring to the uh, to the caucus uh, for the congressional district seven in Illinois. This is when he was a candidate for a position he didn't end up winning uh, in this time around. Uh, but he writes to Martin Morris, who administered that. Uh, that convention and said it would be proper for your or that caucus. It would be proper for your meeting to appoint three delegates and, and to instruct them to go for someone as a first choice, uh, for someone as a someone else as a second, and perhaps someone as a third. And if in those instructions I were named as the first choice, it would gratify me very much. Right? And he recognized in this moment that there's benefit in embracing embracing the spectrum of, of candidate possibility, of, of breaking free of the binary stronghold in orthodoxy and, and questioning whether there's talent that, that may be unseen, that may be veiled right now. Uh, President Lincoln held to that from the start of his political career. And he also created the framework and, and validated the framework in which voters can vote their heart. They can vote their preferential vote, their preferred vote, not just their strategic vote, and, which is their mind vote. Simmons et al. finds that third party support increases under ranked choice voting. Uh, in one of the studies, they found that uh, an experimental study uh, involving a control group that was uh, focusing on, or, or a control group with plurality elections and then the ranked choice voting group, they found that the population they studied was willing to increase their support for third party candidates from about 3.75% to about 7%, uh, nearly doubling of the interest in, in third party candidates, uh, which of course is small. Uh, in in comparison, but when we consider the the marginal uh, the marginal victories that happen in competitive states, uh, it's quite momentous, right? When we consider that ten percent of the electorate uh, is holds status as a no lean independent, uh, that's that's momentous and, and can change races. Uh, and Blaze et al. tied in with McDaniel, I uh, found that twelve percent uh, would switch under an RCB system, uh, which is a slightly inflated number. We woke up to this. Uh, the headline this morning from the New York Times that Kristen Sinema has officially left or is planning to leave the Democratic Party, uh, citing that she will never fit perfectly in either national party, which I think is is how many independents feel. I think it's it's a, a sentiment of my generation, uh, the desire to have progress, common sense progress on the pressing issues of our time, whether it be climate change, whether it be division, whether it be uh, racial division, and 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 we have an opportunity to bridge that, and we understand that having only a binary viewpoint on every topic is, is not sufficient. And I'll mention here, I it was one of the things I appreciated about working with the attorney general staff this summer, mm -hmm. is that every attorney on their, their payroll embraces a complex understanding of their subject. You ask them what their opinion is and they give you seven opinions, mm -hmm. or they give you seven stances or different approaches you could take. Or, <laughs> well, if we had time to research this more, it would have revealed this. They refuse to accept the simplicity that is often fed to the voters. And I think that's something that our generation will ask more of. On the representative side, ranked choice voting has a, a strong performance. Richie Terrell report an increase in a comparison of the, the cities in the Bay Area of 11 California cities that implemented, uh, half of them that implemented RCB and half of them that didn't. They found that during the period 1995 to 2014, women in representation in politics increased from 39.9 to 42.1% in the ranked choice voting cities, while at the same time, in the same time period, it decreased in the plurality control cities from 30.9 to 34.4, which is momentous. Mm -hmm. On the right side, they highlight uh, the breakdown as of 2021 in those cities, the ones that pursued RCV and the ones that held to plurality. And the ones that pursued RCV, women represent 46% of the mayorships uh, and 23% in the plurality cities. It's a strong performance. When we look at ballot exhaustion, I, I want to be sober and, and honest about the, the benefits, the downsides, the operational nuances, not to have rose colored glasses about how we approach the topic. Um, ballot exhaustion is one of the examples where ranked choice voting uh, has some work to do. Uh, like I mentioned, the study from Bernard Kogan, I mentioned in my thesis, is 
highlights four cities uh, that pursued ranked choice voting, Oakland, San Francisco, and San Leandro in California, and then Pierce County in Washington. And of those cities, they found that the ballot exhaustion rates, which is essentially when you vote for uh, a designated number of candidates on your ballot, but your ballot gets tossed out at some point, could be from multiple factors. The main one is uh, voters who bullet vote or vote truncate, which is where they don't use the full number of allotted spaces or they only vote for one candidate. The likelihood of their ballot carrying to the last round of tabulation is much lower. And therefore, in essence, their vote is not being considered uh, in practice by that last round of tabulation. That's what's demonstrated in Oakland, First County, San Leandro, uh, and then San Francisco is the outlier with 27% of the ballots being exhausted. Uh, now I've mentioned before, this is because they had six, 16 candidates on the ballot and they only allowed three slots to be voted, uh, three available slots to the voters, uh, which in practice means that the voter would have to know who those three would be with certainty in order for their ballot to carry on to the last round. Uh, which is impractical and, and one of the challenges being with the administering agency, the administering entity for elections, whether it be the county for Fort Collins, uh, which it, it, it's shaping up to be, right, because it's a November election, the county's outsized influence there, it will be important for the city of Fort Collins to hold the county accountable in, in terms of how many slots are available. Do they limit us to three? Do they limit us to five? If there are 15 candidates, are there only four slots? All of those nuances will affect the ballot exhaustion, which will also affect its efficacy as a case study uh, and its its place on the electoral map of, of other cities looking to Fort Collins as a, a gleaming example. That's our hope. Um, there's some steps that need to happen for that to take place. And then also in Oakland, San Francisco, San Leandro and Pierce, uh, that was the, the vote percentage uh, of the winners was less than 51%. So I think one of the things I've noticed with the RCB proponents is that they're they're very supportive of the idea of the majoritarian concept, that that's the source of legitimacy. How could we elect someone who doesn't have the majority support of the body of the electorate? That's the common sentiment that you hear from advocates. And at the same time, those four examples, none of the candidates receive 51%. And it's important to highlight that story uh, as well in the tabulation process and how that plays into the implementation. One of the other concerns that I've spoken to, I, I found in the um, the annual report on computational intelligence, a group of computer scientists that released this data, this database of research essentially that uh, that highlights some of the benefits, downsides um, of various voting procedures, and, and it's a kind of a holistic computer science review. Uh, they talk about the no-show paradox. They talk about monotonicity. They talk about the Condorcet effect. Those other two I won't talk about today, but the no-show paradox is the one that I think I think scholars and election ministers need to consider more in terms of how they how they sell ranked choice voting to the constituency. As we all know, the lowest candidate or the lowest uh, vote getter of the four would, would be dropped or of the three in this instance. Uh, imagine each of these columns represents a precinct or a neighborhood uh, or a block of voters. Uh, so block one, block two, block three, block four. Uh, what we see immediately is that uh, C has the lowest votes, 25, B has 49 votes, uh, and A has 26 votes. So C is dropped from the race. We move on to those 25 voters next choice, which is A. When we combine the vote, voters from precinct four with precinct one, A has 51 votes. 51% named the winner under this first uh, iteration. Then if we were to revisit and look at the voting block two, precinct number two, 47 voters, 47% of the electorate, voted B, C, A, meaning they want B more than C, they want C more than A. Let's imagine that they didn't come to the polls, that they decided not to vote for whatever reason, they did not show up. Uh, they're disheartened, they're frustrated, whatever their reason may be. And we look to, to B, who received his two votes, the lowest amount. B is then dropped uh, from consideration and those voters, uh, we go to their second choice, which was C. So we now combine C from precinct three, the votes there with precinct four, and we have 27 total votes, which now that those 47 other voters stepped out, the new majority threshold, they, they just crossed 50.9%. So when we revisit that, 47% of the voters, 47 voters said B over C, C over A. When they voted in round one, in the first iteration, A was the victor, their least preferred candidate for 47% of the electorate. In round two, C was, was selected. It was their second choice. More, they wanted C more than A. So the, the instance here that, that scares me, and I think that, that should be given consideration, is 
vote, voting for 47% of the electorate led to A, their least preferred candidate, and not voting led to C, their second, uh, second candidate. That's the risk is that the lottery effect, as Santucci describes it, becomes so that the electorate is, is confused by all of the moving pieces and the variables and the complexity of the system, uh, that they choose not to show up, that they choose exit as their, their pathway. Uh, that is the risk, ultimately, is that although I don't know how widespread this realization will become of not voting being a better representation of your political will than voting, um, but it fails on the fundamental voting theory that showing up to support a candidate, in this instance, showing up to support candidate uh, C, when they voted, it hurt candidate C. When they didn't vote, it helped candidate C reach victory. That's a challenge that we have to bear out and have to determine the probability of that happening, which is one of the contentions I have is that I, I'm not certain how often that will happen. And if the electorate will have the computational knowledge and mathematical context um, to be able to, to use no show paradox as their, as their method of instituting their political will. But it certainly plays a risk. There are other horizon concerns that I have that aren't necessarily in the scholarship, but uh, that I think will be will emerge uh, in the coming years. The first one being gamesmanship. It comes up often. The idea of the political parties manipulating the variables in a way that advances their power. Uh, in this case, the new strategic layout, the new incentive structure is to have one of your candidates or someone who is ideologically aligned with your party be the first one that is eliminated from the race. That's the incentive in, in ranked choice voting, right? Is that the first person that's out, their votes carry over. So if you have a close race and, and you can guarantee that the first person out or even the first two out ideologically aligned with your party, you can almost guarantee a victory in that race. So the, the fear that I have is that they'll try to run one very competitive candidate of their ideological leaning and then as many candidates as possible who are not competitive, not viable uh, on the other end of the spectrum so that the first two, the first three, <laughs> would be ideologically aligned and therefore would bring victory. I think that's a risk that we may see, so much so that maybe the parties at some point will be attacking their own candidates, um, candidates affiliated with their party. So even though we say that it will create a, a culture of, uh, of embracing, of candidates embracing each other and of cooperation and collaboration, um, the fear that intra-party conflict would get worse because of these manipulative gamesmanship um, outcomes, uh, I, I think it's something that needs more time and, and research, and that's what I mentioned in the, the scholarship horizon of what I hope future scholars will dive into. And then the second one being electoral bargaining, right? This concept that under our plurality election, uh, there are, of course, candidates of Fort Collins at a local level are cordial with each other. Um, they attend community events together. They attend debates. Uh, but what does it look like when they have a, an incentive to, to be working so closely together that they're essentially selling each other second place and third place recommendations? saying I'll release a how to vote card to my voters that puts you as second or puts you as third. Does it relegate the deliberative process, the democratic process back into the, the smoke filled rooms? Is that the, the step that we take uh, by pursuing uh, something like ranked choice voting? And we don't know and, and we'll, I'll be curious to see how this plays out over time. But something that does give me hope is Representative Paul Tola, who won the special election after the 48 year Congressman Don Young passed away won the special election. Many were critical and, and skeptical that she would win the general election. Um, she did win the general election as well. Begich uh, and Palin were, were fighting against each other ruthlessly, two strong partisans, two uh, Republicans, not abiding by or paying attention to the new playbook, the new strategic incentives, which given the concerns I raised, one of the benefits of it being that the person who is the most moderate, the person who, who is the most collaborative and, um, and, and embraces embraces other candidates in a respectful, dignified manner. Um, the candidate who's most moderate, like Beltone, right, who, who took many moderate stances for the state of Alaska, uh, she was elected and is the first Native American woman to represent the state of Alaska. So that brings me hope. And of course, the city of Fort Collins, passing by 58% ranked choice voting, and, and it inspires me and, and generates curiosity and it also reminds me that we must be vigilant of how it's implemented. Uh, because if we care about the concept of ranked choice voting, if we truly understand the, the operational nuances and the downsides and the trade-offs of ranked choice voting, it should inspire in us a similar interest in, in working with administrative officials to A, communicate these complexities to the voting base, to the electorate, to ensure that it's a successful case study, uh, but also in being honest about the benefits, the downsides, uh, and having an interest to continue to reform 
so that we can reach our, our democratic uh, objectives. So with that, very grateful for your time and, uh, and thank you for being a part of my committee and I welcome any questions on the research or presentation. Thank you, Christian. Kyle, since you're online, um, do you want to do you want to kick us off with questions that you have? We could also do the opposite, and Martine and I could start here, and then we could defer to you. Um, but sure, I, figured I, that I have a couple, and and I'm happy to, you know, just first off, excellent job, um, well presented, um, well summed, and uh, I, I admire your passion and your advocacy for this. Um, I, one of the concepts that you mentioned, uh, and just to kind of, Christian and I have had many banters back and forth in class about this, and and not about this particular topic that I'm about to throw on him, but um, but it but it is it is somewhat a, an interesting question that I wonder uh, I'd like to hear him riff a little bit on um, before we get into more substantive questions. You mentioned uh, the Condorcet paradox uh in passing and i i think in in the institutional world uh this is often called arrows paradox uh for those of you who are more familiar with that and this is the idea that um either somebody casting a ballot or somebody uh in some way a prefers b b prefer or they prefer a to b they prefer b to c but they prefer C to A, mm -hmm. and that is a paradox um, that plays itself out in all sorts of non-ideological slash popularity ideas. And this is kind of it fits with the no-show paradox. Yes, thank you for putting that up because it it's 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 an extension. So the Condorcet idea is this is this way of thinking about and we often think about a Condorcet compliant or a Condorcet winner of an election of and and RCV and, and Santucci talks about this a good bit. And I know I know that's um, where we're going to go. I would just like to hear. The times, not just the no show paradox, but the other times where the rank choice voting does not lead to a Condorcet winner. And because it does, it doesn't all the time. And the no show paradox is one of those examples. You mentioned that you didn't think that this would be a frequent occurrence, but it is something that can happen and can delegitimize the process, right? Where people watching on see the see the count, see the process, see the media analysis, and then they say, well, it's rigged or well, it's it's a problem, or my side is being cheated against. How do you guard against that other than education? Can you can you can you speak to the ways that and education is a big part of this, and you already mentioned that as a solution, but I'm curious, is is that just an inevitable problem, or is that is that something that practice and 20 years can ameliorate, or is it I just riff on that for a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you mentioning that and, and the Condorcet um, paradox that you mentioned. That one wasn't given as much airtime as as the the concerns around monotonicity, which is very similar to, to the no-show paradox. Monotonicity being if you vote for a candidate, uh, it should never hurt that candidate. Uh, and right. if you don't vote for a candidate, it shouldn't directly help them. It's kind of the yeah, answer, yeah. right? Uh, there have been instances that um, the Nermi and Fala demonstrate where uh, they also fail on the on monotonicity. So monotonicity, no show. And then you mentioned the Condorcet. You know, I think it's challenging. I, Dr. Saunders, from the from the conceptual standpoint, um, it makes sense, right, that there would be this doubt, there would be this fear, um, that there would be a growing uh, concern for the legitimacy of our voting systems if that's not rectified. And at the same time, I, I challenge that that who, who it is that we're electing, ultimately it's people, right? I think one of the misconceptions that, that I've often realized is we talk about our systems, we talk about our um, our system of government, uh, systemic issues, and, and sometimes we forget that ultimately the system is a collection of people. Uh, and so my, I, I guess my more philosophical answer to that, Dr. Saunders, is that the, the individuals that we are electing 
will have proven based based on my research, we, we can demonstrate that they will have more moderate standpoints on average and appeal more broadly to the electoral base uh, than those candidates that are elected under a plurality mechanism. And, and so although there may be questions about, well, I wanted this candidate versus that candidate, or I'd rather have uh, B, I'd rather have, if it were B between A, I'd rather choose uh, B, but if it were C between B, maybe I'd rather choose C. Right. How it plays out, I think the candidate quality will matter so much in terms of the level of satisfaction, because that's yeah. ultimately, that's the most formative um, factor in, in our trust in government, I believe, is the trust we have in people to lead us well and to lead our systems well. And so my trust in ranked choice voting and accomplishing candidate quality and attracting more candidates uh, in loosening the stranglehold in which the parties feel not only obligated, but in, in order to in order to maintain power, they have to whittle down when when come the general election. I think all of the loosening those factors and changing the incentives will bring about more um, more contentment. And then the last thing I'll say to the theme of uh, of contact, right? I think contact is so important. And we found, let me see if I can find the exact data point here. Uh, they found that young people especially were significantly more likely to be contacted by their elected officials under the ranked choice voting system than under the plurality. And so all of your questions, um, assuming that legitimacy or delegitimacy, de de delegitimizing comes from the outcome of the vote, I would argue that any contact with the electorate that wouldn't have happened otherwise is a net gain for society because we become more informed, we become more engaged, we get to know our elected officials. You sure as heck hope so. No, I, well, well answered, well answered. And and I, I think, you know, when I think about this inside of that answer and think about candidate recruitment, and obviously Kristen and I just had a parties and elections class together. So this is, this is a little bit off topic, but I think he'll understand where I'm going, is your, your point about the system itself incentivizing candidates of perhaps higher quality amidst this trend away from party, the ability for parties to recruit candidates who are relatively moderate because the parties are weak on that front, right? And so the system itself encouraging more and more candidates may or may not lead to candidate quality in the short term. Right. It, it, there's there's a there's a real chance that you'll have some amateurism and you'll have other aspects of this that are also going to be incentivized in this because there's no central control of and no necessarily party mechanism that's doing the selective de-recruitment that one often sees inside a more tight primary system. So. I, I, I think you're right, though, that over the medium term and the longer term, there should be a, an equilibrium, at least with regard to this incentive system, that gives you more, at least more efficacy for good candidates to see that they have a shot. Right. And that and, and that's a good. Good in this case means. Depolarizing to a certain extent and and. Whether or not that's assured, what role the parties play in all of that, because ultimately, and th this is this is where I want to hear you speak, is this idea of do parties and will parties like ranked choice voting being implemented? And if you don't have party support, because one of the parties want to control the candidates is back to the responsible party model, all that stuff, right? Will parties support this, or is it going to have to be continue continue to be something driven by voter participation? And maybe it should be, but do you see the parties being an opponent because of exactly these the, the things that you're setting up? Absolutely, I I think there's there's an argument to be made certainly that the the party. I appreciate you mentioning the amateurism and, and the, the responsible party wanting to control as many variables as possible, to fix as many variables as possible. Uh, and a, a broad swath of candidates uh, 
especially those with no political background or, or career, presents a challenge there, right? Um, their electability, all of these other factors that the party not only may not be able to, to assess or evaluate, but they may not be in a position to enact, to act on that. Um, and that's where I actually argue in the end of my, my thesis that I think ranked choice voting poses a threat to the two-party system at this point. And I think RCB proponents, if they are wise, will start to target the primary process. We'll sell this to the parties for the primary process, primary election, in order to moderate their um, their electoral the primary. You mean having ranked choice voting for the primary or yeah. replacing the primary with ranked choice voting? Uh, so having it for the primary. Okay. It is yeah, one of those. Exactly. Awesome, yeah. right? so Keep this, going. Keep going. Virginia, right, with Glenn Youngkin. That was that selection was under ranked choice voting model, uh, and he he was able to, to take the governorship, right? I think of other examples where, um, I mean, the jungle primary being a good one, but that's a blanket primary in Alaska that that of course molds the two parties together. Um, but nonetheless, I think if you could make the case, Colorado being another good example where uh, we had a number of election deniers that ran during the the party primary, right, of this most recent election cycle. Uh, and most of them, if not all of them, lost right during the primary. The open, uh, the open primary moderated the, uh, or I may have to to confirm that if they're open or closed. I'm an independent, so I. Yeah, it's, I, it's open here because you were able to vote. You right. you just have to pick. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. but their choice to open uh, their primary to uh, independents it moderated the dialogue. And so I would argue that ranked choice voting does that in a way that. It's politically ingenious, and it's also achieved the goal, I believe, of the party, which is to moderate to a candidate that can then succeed in the general election. And RCB is designed to accomplish exactly that. So my mentality is sell it to the parties to implement on a primary level, and they see the efficacy, they see the value, they see that higher quality candidates are emerging. And for the, the very few, hopefully most of them who genuinely want to serve and genuinely want to improve our system, they would see better leaders who are more effective, who are serving the constituency better, who are more responsive, who are creating more enthusiasm surrounding government, who are rebuilding the trust in government. I'd have to believe that that would be a, the pretext for them adopting it in the election, in the general election. Well answered. I turn over to the mic. Uh, let me let me build off of that really quickly too. Um, what's interesting too is like right now the dynamic that we have nationally is that one party and unaffiliated voters slash independent voters seem to support ranked choice voting. So there's like tacit approval in the Democratic Party, but if ranked choice voting is successful at do at achieving what it intends to achieve, like increasing third party candidacies, moderating candidates. It, in, if the Democratic Party stays as sort of like we have one party that's more extreme and one party that's more moderate, it'll work in a ranked choice voting system. If the parties realign, would you agree that more tension will emerge and parties basically if in the next 10 years ranked choice voting is successful, we might see the parties turn against it? Because that's what that's what Santucci would say we saw 100 years ago. Would you agree with that to some extent? And then my question for you, if, if he's, I don't think. He, oh, me, oh, I thought, okay, I just want to make sure that I, I didn't know if you would. I, I, I'm ready to answer that. Um, the, yes, um, I think that's that's exactly how I think about it. In fact, I think it could happen faster than that. Um, because I think there are forces inside the parties with regard to campaign finance and other aspects that do not want to see moderation. Um, or at least are positioned against it. And this is this is one way. In fact, when we did when we did our wrap up in class, I was I, I presented it this way, is that there are so many and, and Sam, you've heard this in 501, right? There are so many forces that are polarizing, that are pulling these the parties and elected officials apart, that ranked choice voting is one of those things that could provide a moderating influence. But you still have four or five, six other levers that are pull, that are still acting against it. And whether or not, and sooner or later, ranked choice voting probably is going to become one of the issues, just like primaries, that parties really would prefer a closed primary um, instead of an open primary, right? And and so how does that act? How does that play itself out? And will sooner or later parties start acting against this? in ways just like they actually, I mean, just like here in Colorado, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party actually opposed 
moving to the open primary. Now they lost, they lost the plebiscite, but they still, they still actively would prefer closed primaries tomorrow. Um, and sooner or later, they're going to say, well, we don't really, we aren't really fans of break choice voting either because we don't necessarily want to moderate. It's my guess, but I, how long that takes to play out, I have no idea. Since we're on the topic of party control, can we go to the example that you listed from the Bay Area where more women and candidates of color were, were elected after the implementation of ranked choice voting? Is your sense from reading that that is a direct result of less party control under the ranked choice voting system? Is that what we're seeing here? It, are we seeing the, the the parties tend to like the rest of society, emulate rest of society and be sort of, you know, if you look at who's in leadership positions in, in both of the political parties, historically, it's been, you know, men. Um, is this something, are we seeing a shift in terms of party control right here leading to a direct result that increases equity and representation? I believe so, yes. And based on Richie Terrell says, uh, outlines a and there's there's multiple factors, right? So I it could be it could be the stability of the elections. It could be it could be other factors, right? You, you in the past have mentioned publicly uh, funded elections and in the worlds of that place. I would need to look more in depth to know which of those California cities had um, publicly funded elections. So there could be multiple factors there. But what I will mention that Richie Terrell uh, spells out in detail is the culture that especially women of color in in these cities faced of the party queue before and after ranked choice voting implementation. This mentality that uh, that there are others and that uh, you have to earn your space, your your place on the on the ballot and, and that there are others who have been more involved, more engaged, uh, who have started more businesses, who are more um, integrated with the community, whatever their argument may be. And I think what Richie Terrell suggests and what the data bears out is that uh, it, it takes away it no longer makes the party the arbiter of candidate quality, but it, it truly delegates that to the electorate. I think on a local level, it's particularly effective. I think to to Saunders' point, um, at the at the state level, for federal elections, I think the powers will converge and will try to eradicate ranked choice voting, like you mentioned, right? The progressive era adopts it, the loosening of the two party stronghold, and then many of them uh, ban it and uh, yeah. following the progressive era. So I think that will happen. But I would argue yes, that that's one of the trend connections. Thank you. Interesting. And I'll mention too, um, yeah. Dr. Saunders, your concern is, is valid. I wonder, you know, I almost wonder who it is within the party that uh, that would be resisting the moderating influence of RCB. My guess is their fear, their fear is that it proves effective as a case study in the primary election. And that is the pretext to then move on and adopt it with the general election. I could see the jump. Um, but in the sense of, the, at least just in, in my conception of broadcast media over the last election cycle, there was great fear that the election deniers would be the nominees and would eliminate any chance of electoral oh, victory. I, I, I think short term, you're absolutely correct. I'm thinking more medium term. Like after, after they assess how it fits in with their incentives that they're subject to. I, I think you're right short term because it's so salient right now. Um, but I think the longer term, the more you play the iterated game, it does go back to the, the example of what you, you know, the progressives giving it a shot and the major parties saying, nope, we want control back. Did you, what was your time thing? Five minutes. Huh? Uh, five or ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask, but I think you got to it pretty good in the Q and A. So maybe we go on to other things because yeah. I know I think your first research question was focused around partisan division, but I didn't get as much focus on that in your presentation. Mm -hmm. But then you you brought out several different arguments. But I was going to get you maybe to talk a little bit more about how does ranked choice voting kind of alleviate or or exacerbate kind of partisan division? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if you got something else you want to jump in there now that you haven't, but. Partly in the, in the answer Q and A, you, you got to that some, but yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. you mentioned at the end of, of your paper that you know you didn't really get into disability, that question of does it increase or decrease civility. I don't know if you got you know some senses of that. Yeah, but it's challenging. It's so hard to quantify. Right. right? Yeah. I think that was the issue yeah. I found. Yeah. In others, other Much scholars, less yeah. right? Other <laughs> scholars try to. They tried to yeah. make um, consensus statements about where the scholarship stands on things like civility. Yeah. Um, but with it being so subjective, uh, it's so yeah. difficult to quantify. I didn't want to make that a central pillar of my research. Yeah. But what I will mention is that civility 
insofar as myself as an elect as a candidate for elected office, I cannot afford to in the new incentive structure cannot afford to ostracize the base of my competitor. Yeah. Doing so would be a losing strategy. Right. Right. We see that with um, with Maine District Two, Bruce Poliquin. Uh, this was the 2018 midterm election when he he essentially convinced. I need to look back at the, the statistic, but it was the majority of his voting base he con convinced to bullet vote. Um, kind of similar to the ideological concerns that you need to protect the ideological purity of your ballot, just vote for me. It was a losing strategy. It lost him the election. Yeah. And and in the same vein, I would say if he had if he had shifted and he had not ostracized the bases of the independent candidates that were in the race, or even his competitor, who's a who is a Democrat, uh, I think he may have won. And he had the incumbency on his behalf, but he still lost because of that. Uh, not responding to the the change in um, in, in incentive structure, and, and the same thing for Alaska. It's something I really did appreciate. And I don't know if that's just an ethic of the state. Uh, Dr. Saunders can share. I, I did my uh, 15 page paper on Alaska this last week, and uh, learning about some of the the cultural. You got an a. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Breaking. Um, but the the debate was so civil. I, I really appreciated that, and, and not to say it's different for other. Um, Regions, but they, it, it was almost <laughs> it was almost annoyingly civil, where they they felt like they were all answering with the exact same response, yeah. which I mean that that may be one of the downsides. They all have the same opinion on all the same topics. How is that? How can that be possible? Right, right. Yeah. But nonetheless, yeah, I would argue you can be too civil, right? Yeah, so but, it's a but, balance to to hit, not a, something you maximize. Totally. But an example where the the point of gravity is is towards the center as opposed to towards the ends of the spectrum. Well. Well, I don't know if there's a question here, but one quick thing, if, yeah. if you're continuing with this, right? Because when you, when you like the, the question of game gamification, right? Can people game this too much? Uh, you know, with the deliberation stuff, deliberation is often kind of attacked for not reaching this ideal. And I always try to shift it and it's like, don't compare us to like perfect deliberate, like compare us to our competitors, right? Like, are, are we doing better? Uh, and obviously we're seeing a lot of gamification of the current system, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even even the Democrats there, right? Of pouring a lot of money into the worst Republican candidates. Yes. Think, you know, uh, you know, so when you look at gamification, make sure you kind of look at that too, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, ranked choice voting, but I, I think it's probably harder to gamify ranked choice voting yeah. than it is just a pluralistic yeah. system. Right? It, it would be harder in, in my argument, I not, doesn't bear out the data yet, at least, but hopefully will be researched. Is how do the super PACs respond to that? Right, right. they can't get directly to the the party campaigns, no. uh, the party order campaigns. But how? What is their messaging? Right, is there? I, I think two things we need to look for: vote suppression. We talk about it at an administrative level. I think we need to start considering that at an ideological level in the ways that that will play out. If super PACs are financing campaign ads to the effect of right cozying up to one of the candidates in the race or to their ideological or even do we see it in florida like creating a pretend green candidate or totally. yep. you know the democrats can create a pretend libertarian candidate right you know just to kind of siphon off a, a few of the votes from the other side exactly. right and what if i can convince you that you need to bullet vote you need to protect the ideological purity of your ballot right. with like a mantra like i say in the paper we can't take a chance bullet vote right, right. if that were to come if that were to take hold in mass Two things happen. Ranked choice voting becomes superfluous because if everyone is is uh, bullet voting, it's essentially a plurality election. That's how it plays out in practice. Um, and then the other concern being, uh, does it disenfranchise all of those voters who who follow that uh, that manipulated playbook? And so I think those are one of the concerns. But then I would also argue that super PACs, the return on investment becomes very obscure with political investments. And I think that's something we'll see. Right. This and attack ads. And yeah, and attack right. ads, yeah. and you have yeah. this amateurism, and you have so many candidates that it's not exactly clear where yeah. I, as a funder or as a donor, should send my dollars to maximize the likelihood of my party winning. Right. That all becomes a Pandora's box once yeah. RCB is implemented, which may play a moderating role as well in campaign finance. Yeah. And I know pretty much out of time, but one thing, and I don't know if there's a quick thing here, just a thought, but because uh, you, know, you do end up kind of recommending this, but then a lot of this discussion, well, hey, well, what will the parties, will the parties turn against this? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious in a sense of, do you have a, is there a distinction between kind of local races versus state races versus federal races? Mm -hmm. Do you feel stronger or weaker about mm -hmm. the, the value of ranked choice voting kind of across votes? Absolutely. Because obviously technically local are, are not as partisan, are not as party politics, you know, depending on where you are, there's, right. there's often, you know, to what degree, does the Democratic or Republican Party really influence Fort Collins races yeah. or not behind the scenes or not? I know. Yeah. But. Well, I think with with each level, I have less uh, faith in how RCV will be implemented. Yeah. I have the most trust at the local level. Yeah. I think state level, it will be challenging. The, the medium term factors Dr. Saunders was describing. 
I think at the local level, that's our case study ground. That's our case to prove this ability to prove the increased candidate representation, all of these other factors, just like the data bared out. The local level was really came through for us on the data for this research. Um, I think at the state level, a concerted effort to institute RCB for primary elections and, and see how it goes from there. And if they want to adopt it for the general election, I of course welcome that. Um, but I would say I have the most faith in the local level. Yeah. And one example being District 4, Melanie Patiandi in the event that uh, Sam and I hosted, mm -hmm. uh, mentioned how she was asked by a lot of, uh, she ran District 4, for those of you that don't know, mm -hmm. there were seven, eight candidates? I think five. Was it five candidates? It one, one, one conservative and four progressives. Exactly. Yeah. And, and she mentioned that uh, at times she had, uh, well, in sharing this in confidence, I guess, this is on a recording, so I don't want to quote exactly, but yeah. to the effect of like, well, why don't you um, drop out or come in right. centers to drop out? Why don't you yeah. whittle down so we can yeah. ensure that we don't split? And then the other the other one, the other that was running for the third party, right? He did do that, right? That he ended up dropping out because his can the other candidate had more money. Which yeah. candidate? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The guest at that event. Oh, Oh, that was in a previous right, right, election. Previous election, exactly. election yeah, right. yeah, he yeah. gave an example. That from he kind of gave well, that's an example of yeah, the decision of who the candidate was was made based on fundraising yep. versus the public vote or that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Or even someone oh, like, right. if I can offer Blake Masters in yeah. Arizona, right? Carrie Lake, who runs Blake Masters, um, remind me that their name, Pamela, uh, I mean, uh, the, the governor of Arizona who did end up getting elected. But it's interesting to see how that played out where Masters was riding the, the independence wave and then at the the 11th hour um, dropped out and if i'm remembering right saunders you can correct me endorsed uh carrie lake if i'm remembering right i, I know many who supported him were not support were mad that he did that were frustrated that he did that yeah. um, under an rcb system he could hold a viable candidacy without having yeah. to drop out at the last right. minute so there's some of this patronage that i can't really describe but um i think rcb solves for I would be curious. I don't expect you to know this, but with that that example of more women and and, and people of color, were they also generally more moderate, right, um, or not, right? In some ways, I would assume so. But then also, you know, we do have like, yeah. sort of overt and <laughs> it'll be. I think I think in certain regions, it'll be very possible slash plausible that the. Just like in a plurality system, the more extreme partisan will probably still win. Um, you could see that where there's there's not a moderating effect. It's simply it would be interesting. I think at the local level, it would be different. Um, but that's because the local level tends to have nonpartisan elections already. Um, and that's, you know, you Kyle, you asked <clears throat> about party supporting RCV, and, and Christian kind of talked about primary systems and the specific value proposition that it holds there. What, what I hear from people on the right and the left who are political operatives is that they don't support or uh, they're not for or against this quite yet because they simply just don't know the gamesmanship. They don't know how this is going to help their candidates or hurt their candidates. And so they're 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 not taking a firm position either way, but they're very much thinking about sort of under the current rules and the current approach and strategies, how can how can they shift those slightly, adjust those to potentially still elect their candidates? Um, yep. And Chris talked about this recently a bunch in terms of the interesting strategies uh, that both the local Republicans and the Democrats, the local Republicans and Democrats actually have very different electoral strategies. Um, I would say that the, the local Democratic strategy will play much be much better into a ranked choice voting system because they're primary unaffiliated voters, yep. unlike the Republicans whose primary focus is the Republican voters. And so it's very interesting to see how that, the, the, the strategies already in place will impact uh, the ability for for campaigns and candidates to be successful. One hundred percent.